Funny news over the weekend because Xbox kind of fell over for a bit. And it fell over in a way that meant that people could not play their games. And it was a bit of a unique issue because of specific stuff, or basically of how things run with publisher DRM. So, Matt, what's the deal? What's happened? So, it turns out that, you know, you can just play games offline, or you'd hope so, right? You would. You'd hope, okay, offline mode, no problem. I've got the disc right here. I can play my games. I bought those games. I can play them. Great. No. This outage that was, uh, it didn't, like, last entirely the four days, but people have been experiencing intermittent, can't play the games that I own for the past uh, weekend. And it turns out it's just exposed a load of Xbox's uh, DRM practices, stuff that we didn't know about, stuff that they're not transparent about. And people are calling it back to the, uh, you know, the days of the Xbox One where oh, yes. Don Matrick introduced was like, this baby has to be online once every 24 hours or your games are gone. If you're playing on a, if you're playing the games you own on a different console, check in every hour because we don't trust you at all. Your publishers don't trust you. No one trusts you. People are like, oh. They didn't tell us they were doing that for the Xbox Series X, and they aren't literally, but the same effect has happened, where the DRM that we thought we'd beaten is just straight back here. It's brutal. So essentially what happened is, this Friday then, people people just found they couldn't play their games, and this just kind of happened for a while over the weekend. I think it was mostly fixed um, on Saturday, but then some new issues appeared. Essentially... It was just intermittent messy stuff. There's yeah. even some people reporting, now it's Monday, uh, some people still reporting some intermittent issues. Yeah, it seems to be that uh, the whole thing was a massive Xbox outage where all of their servers are down, so anytime your console phoned home, it got an error instead. And like, okay, that makes sense, right? <clears throat> so we'll bring it back online. They brought it back online, but there was, I don't know what it is. No one's actually found out what the problem is. But it seems to be like console configuration stuff where they now that the servers are back up, they still can't contact. And like it takes a couple of full restarts or full reboots or in some cases factory resets in order to actually be able to connect to the servers again. So that's why it's like intermitting. The root cause has been fixed, but the like the um, the reverberations of it are still kind of happening to people. So people just can't play the games that they own. Ah, interesting. So yeah. to kind of drill in on what happened. Essentially, the store went down a bit, which meant you can't buy games, no DLC. G Game Pass, major selling point for Microsoft, that had issues. Cloud gaming stuff went down, and then you couldn't launch any digital game that would want to phone home because it would want to verify the license, and that would include everything on Game Pass. Uh, now, of course, in this case, a bunch of users will be pissed off. They will, as we've talked about, think, oh, great, I have a physical disc. I will play that. And then they suddenly find out that's not actually how things work. Their disc, I mean, what is a disc? It contains some data on it. And your Xbox reads that data. But the idea of just running an EXE off a disc is just not really much of a thing or as much of a thing. Yeah, so the thing about, like, discs as licenses has been, like, kind of purported a lot, a lot recently. And obviously it used to not be the case. Obviously anyone who's a PC gamer will know that for sure. You know, your disc came with some stuff you can install on it, but then it just came with a license key you had to put into play. Yeah, and then sometimes the software would try to make sure you had the disc in. So yeah. even for a game you purchased legally, you would get the, like, the, the crack or the whatever. Secure ROM CD stuff, yeah. Yeah, something like that. So you didn't even have to bother putting the CD into your computer because... That was a pain in the ass and probably ages us a little bit. I have a feeling that's something people, I mean, people just use Steam. They haven't dealt with discs, have they? Yep, for sure. And it's some sometimes still the case for you to just get a disc that has the game on it. Like PS5 games are very much that, where it's, they won't come with day one patches. So obviously you're going to want to go online. But if you have an offline PS5 and you put the disc in, it'll just play. Not so true on the Xbox because it's become a lot more, obviously, you know, the Xbox and PC thing. They're kind of a little bit like coming together because of where games are available and that's kind of just ended up there. So the DRM issue is honestly just way worse than anyone thought because all of the normal solutions, physical discs, go for those, or play on offline mode. People thought that should work, but turns out a lot of them actually didn't. Yeah, and they thought that if you set your Xbox to your home console, that mm -hmm. would also, like, remove some of those license checks, but that's not something that was working consistently. Yeah, it's like, that's clearly, that's clearly, like, the line that Xbox follow. Yeah. This is the solution to this problem. We've thought about this. We know this can happen. You know, you can be offline for any reason. Here's the solution, but it just doesn't work. Yeah. And, and no one's addressed it. It's an interesting topic. It's something the modern vintage gamer brought up. 
Yep. Um, that happened uh, like a, a year ago. Just showing off weird restrictions. And that's the thing. It's, it's fine most of the time, but as soon as you test some of the edge cases, it doesn't work how you intuitively think it would work, yeah. especially if you were coming from the PS5 uh, yep. background. So basically, to talk about how things work then for discs, uh, backward compatible games, so original Xbox and Xbox 360, they need to connect to the server to install the emulator and grab configs. Yep. Which I, I guess seems reason that's reasonable enough. Yeah, it seems reasonable, but at the same time, people thinking, oh, it's backwards compatible. That means, you know, I can take my Series X into the woods with all of my Xbox 360 games and have a good time. Not unless you install them first, which is not how those games worked. Yeah, so that that's a shame. You would almost you you would hope that they would give you a way to do that in a in advance, but I uh, yeah. I guess that's an edge case that you probably will never run into, but you should probably know because at least it's interesting. Uh, for Xbox One games, they actually do need to install uh, specific configs as well. That requires a, um, a connection during install. Hmm. For smart delivery discs, they only physically contain the Xbox One version, as it turns out. Yep, for so, storage restrictions, yeah. Yeah, so if you know for Series X, well, you'll you'll need to be connected for. Uh, for that, now, native Series X games, they do work fine, but, uh, of course, smart delivery has made them not really be the default. Yep. Yeah. And then that's obviously easy compared, because not to compare this overall is like, oh, Sony have won out here, because obviously everyone faces server issues, but in terms of, like, physical discs, you put a, you put a PS4 disc in the PS5 offline, works fine. PS5 disc in it, works fine. Obviously, unless you're playing a live service game that requires online compatibility, because, you know, there's going to be cases like that. Something you can't just put a Destiny disc in and play as an example, but that's a case where absolutely it's just like it works as you would expect on the PS5, but not over an Xbox because they've kind of like they've assumed people will have connections and they haven't had like put in workarounds for when they don't. Yeah, and that's basically just led to their situation being fragile. Yep, I mean, there's, exactly. There's things that would suck that could happen very normally, like you've downloaded a few Game Pass games, your connection's down. You don't want to be screwed when that happens. Yeah, that should be fine. That, that should be fine. But and even if I think about, like, my own situation, the two apartments that I'm used to being in, sometimes my internet just goes down. Thanks, Virgin Media. And similar for BT and the other one. Or at the very least, those are rocky connections. And it's that strange thing. Would it massively impact me all the time? No. But there's a little bit of peace of mind... It's like that thing where people... Do you remember Steam used to be a pain in the ass for offline play? Yeah. Like years and years and years ago. That would always be frustrating, and it would always make me kind of just want to have an EXE that I could run on my computer without Steam. Because piracy is a better service? Yeah, that was the worst part of Steam. Yep. Then they made that, well, way better. And it's, yeah, it's kind of unfortunate that doesn't happen. But to go back to what we talked about at the top... The massive thing with Xbox DRM, we, we kind of thought that had happened. And I don't think this is at all a case of Microsoft being, uh, you know, super angry or super aggro about any of this. I think they probably just developed their systems with a set of assumptions. Hmm. It's like if they wanted to be really aggro about this, they could have just did what they did in 2013 hmm. and tried to push like a more restrictive setup like that. And I have a feeling they just architected things the way that they did, and that's led to a decently fragile position. Almost not the same, but similar to how Sony had frustrated a lot of indies. Not because Sony necessarily wanted to frustrate indies, but just because their back end and the way that they had built out how they do things was just a bit out of date. Almost exactly that, where you can see, especially in the disc uh, instance, you can see how this is, well... You know, you're, you're going to want the specific configs for these games. You're going to want to, you know, download the stuff that makes them run better. You're going to want the patches. So obviously any engineer will go, well, if I'm going to get this to work, I might as well do it properly and do it fully. And then obviously you're also developing this on a time frame. So you're maybe not going to have the time to go, okay, well, now I need to handle a whole bunch of edge cases for like not having connection or connection suddenly not being there. Because uh, it's apparently if you set your console to offline mode, it does some work that will make this a little better or mm. should but ultimately it doesn't all the time, and this is where some of the complaints come. But fundamentally, it is a case of it's just not designed to be an offline console whatsoever. That's basically the ifs and buts of it. Like, Yeah. Um, I guess doubly good that we didn't end up with Don's original plan. Hell like, yeah. ju just the idea, if you were logged in to a console that's not your home console, uh, you had to be online once every hour, 
And if it was your home console, it was once every 24 hours. I mean, you, you just know what they were trying to do with that. Um, but while maybe Microsoft are uh, not the villain here or something to that effect, um, we do have to talk about publishers. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. So a bit funny, uh, essentially, uh, per Jazz Gordon anyway, he just said spoilers, some publishers want DRM checks even in offline games. Of course. Cool. I mean that's the whole thing. We first had this like as a as a gaming community, we first had to deal with this like maybe around 2011, 2013, maybe around then when it was like what was the first one? I think the first one was like maybe like Assassin's Creed 2 or something. That was on PC and wanted you to be on- online all the time. Might not have been that one, but it was definitely something Ubisoft were doing. And everyone's like this is bullshit. I don't have a connection all the time and I want to play your game. And that's a case of that's just basically kind of gotten worse a little yeah. bit. That was a rocky time in gaming. Like, we had the whole thing where, I remember the codes you had, like the single-use codes um, for getting online stuff. Um, I mean, I could understand the publisher's perspective because the the entire pre-owned games market is designed to earn retailers money and not earn the people who fund or make the games any money. So I do get that. But from a customer perspective, we started to have these online requirements. If you... I don't know, landed a game from your friend. Now, apparently, they expected you to pay $10. Like, yeah. all this stuff that just felt shitty. And then it went, launched straight into Don Matrix saying all that stuff for the new gen. Yeah. Um, it's kind of funny. We've went from almost disaster to disaster, spooky thing to spooky thing. And it seems like the pushback has generally worked. It's just weird that we still do have some reverberations of that. It's just not exactly in a way where the average user bumps into it that often. That's exactly why, like, this is, like, the server outage has basically exposed this. Yeah. Where it's like, okay, under normal circumstances, this is all kind of okay. This is fine. Most people have connections. Some edge cases will be caught off guard by it. But usually you'll be okay. But with the server outage, it's kind of showed, oh, no. If these servers go down for, like, four hours, that's four hours of no one playing a game, despite the fact you do have some offline protections because we didn't really talk about it, but like it, it affects a lot of digital games kind of haphazardly, yeah. kind of at random for what you what you um, own, because MVG, uh, Modern Vintage Gamer, had like trouble sometimes. Some of it was solved when it went into the home mode, but not all of it, because it's like the publisher individually decides, oh, we want our games to be DRM checked, even if, you know, I don't think we have details, but like, you know, it hasn't been launched in a couple months or a couple weeks, so phone home again, just to make sure this isn't like a pirated copy or yeah. someone offline, stuff like that. That's just the awkward thing where it's just, oh man, it's all just exposed how much you kind of don't see any of this. Mm. But I think MVG puts it really well in his video when he says, "In you know, he can go and get a 25-year-old console, get a 25-year-old game, plug it in, assuming he has the correct uh, connectors, and it works. Not the same for an Xbox Series X as it exists in, you know, well, I guess it was out a year ago. In 24 years from now, are we guaranteed for that to be supported? Are those servers going to be online? Will the internet exist as it is in 25 years? It's the sort of thing, like, it doesn't feel important to us now. It doesn't feel important to the companies, but it would be good to play those games. And it's it's that bizarre thing for me. I value this so much less for a 360 or PS3 because of (laughs) what that generation basically was. (laughs) But you go back a bit and... I think you have a lot of games that didn't get caught in a weird technological middle ground. Hmm. Say, like, I don't know, Super Mario 64. Just like all those games that feel absolutely fantastic to play, and one of the great ways to play them is just to get the console you owned a long time ago, plug it in, Hmm. adapter, and it's good. And and now we're at that stage again where our games, they they run 4K60 in, in many cases, or at least 1440p60. And... I think that while graphics are certainly going to advance in 10, 20 years, I think these are still games that are going to hold up and look pretty damn good. Mm. It's just kind of weird that it might not be a situation where you can turn on your old console. Because like if there's retro game collectors now, mm. stuff 20 years ago, 20 years time, surely people will like to have a few things collected from now. Yeah, That doesn't seem as possible. Yeah. And that being said... And so many of the games that come out are big AAA live services. I don't know who wants to collect that shit, but you get my point. Yeah, that's that's an entirely different kettle of fish of live services being inherently like their own DRM by itself. Not really for the point, but just the kind of... Because they all want you connected yeah. to their server to make the most money out of you. But it's still that case of like, just the fact that, you know, you're paying for Game Pass. 
your connection goes off, especially if you live somewhere where it's not reliable all the time, then suddenly if DRM's a pain in your ass, then this is a substantially worse product. And I think a lot of the problem is that this isn't what we expect from Phil Spencer's Xbox. No. We would expect something a lot more transparent, something a lot more clear. Because the fact that publishers have different DRM requirements and it takes Jess Corden to have to talk to his contacts to try and figure that out, as opposed to the game telling you, oh, hey, yeah, all of your off, like this won't be playable offline. You don't see that when you buy it. For a lot, I mean, obviously a lot of these games will also be uh, live servicing and stuff, but I think that's I think that's ultimately what's next. I think there's been enough backlash to this that I fully expect some sort of communication from them because they're pretty good at communicating other issues. So I'm mm-hmm. hoping we kind of get a little bit of a big wave of pushback, especially from people who like had you know they don't have time during the week, they have the weekend off, and then they sit down to play their Xbox, and then it just doesn't work. And it's like those nine hours of like or twelve hours of like solid downtime overlap with the only like six hours they have free the whole week. And that's just this really hyper negative experience. So hopefully the pushback does result in the same kind of feedback we got from the Don Matrick days, where everyone was like, What the hell are you doing with this? And then Sony made that video of how do you <laughs> how do you give someone your game? Hand over the box copy, that's it, you're done. So hopefully there'll be some sort of response. Yeah. And I like to think that this current era of Xbox is one that is a bit more open, that is maybe more willing to engage with a topic like this. So hopefully that by bringing this to light, some good change can happen for for consumers and also just for the the preservation and and the general anti-fragility of gaming platforms. Well, that's the thing I think is interesting. They won't make a massive change for the sake of preservation, but they will make a massive change for the sake of uh, user experience and user feedback. And kind of how users are engaging with it now. So hopefully this is a case where they've overlined. And the frustration that users are feeling of being left in the dark and not knowing how their games work. Hopefully that also means that Xbox Series X games won't be destroyed in 20 years time whenever they t- turn servers off. Not that they will, but you know. Yeah. So there you go. Uh, I guess I'll just say um, I was playing PC games over the weekend, so it didn't yep. impact yep. me. <laughs> uh, but did this impact you over the weekend? If so, let us know. And uh, well, that's it for today. See you next time.